Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, as I said uh, just a, a minute ago, uh, the name is David Failing, and uh, I'm with Lucas Diesel Systems. And on behalf of Lucas, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone today to the, uh, I believe this is the seventh webinar of uh, 2024. As most of you who are joining us on a monthly basis know, uh, this is a, a monthly webinar um, hosted by uh, Lucas Diesel Systems. And um, if anyone has uh, some feedback for us with regards to the presentation, uh, subject matter, et cetera, et cetera, you know, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, we will have uh, our email addresses up there and phone numbers so you can contact us. A couple of housekeeping items. First of all, for those of you who are joining us live uh, and join us for the entire presentation, you'll receive a link so that you can get a um, a certificate uh, from Lucas uh, for participating in this uh, in this webinar. In addition, uh, we've uh, muted everyone so that we don't have any distractions. But if you have any questions uh, with regards to the presentation, etc., uh, you can put them in at the bottom of your screen, or maybe it's at you're at the top for you. Uh, you can put them in the chat. And uh, or the Q and A, either one, and we will be addressing the questions as we go along, as time uh, allows. In addition to that, uh, at the end, we will allow um, uh, enough time for a Q and A. So stay tuned uh, for that. Don't just log off right at the end. Um, our presenter today is Tony Salas, and as most of you know, Tony is a veteran technician and instructor on light duty diesel systems. Uh, he has his own professional shop in uh, Las Vegas, as well as a uh, school. And he does a number of uh, training classes, whether they're live or whether they're um, um, uh, on a, a webinar. Or if not, I believe he has some on his website as well. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Tony. His uh, presentation today is entitled Diesel Emissions. A look and how light duty manage it. Tony, welcome. Thank you, David. Once again, thank you all for attending. It is a lovely Tuesday, almost the end of the month, July 2024. Uh, it's been an interesting, uh, actually, it's been a busy uh, last few months. Usually, uh, when it comes to training, you know, summer months are usually slow, but surprisingly, I've been busy for the simple fact, as you may have seen, those who've gotten my uh, my email uh, in terms of the email blast uh, probably saw that I've been doing some on shop or on in, on location shop training. Uh, so therefore, guess what they have for me? Surprise trucks. So it kind of puts me on the spot in order to diagnose these trucks. And I would say the last few shops that I've been to these last few months, including this month, uh, it has been a lot of emission related DPF after treatment, the, all that stuff. Now, nine months ago, if you go to the Lucas YouTube uh, channel, you're going to see that we did a uh, after treatment. So if you're a little rusty on after treatment, go to the Lucas YouTube site and you're going to see a video that I did about nine months ago on after treatment. Come on, it is now 2024. So in this case, you should be up to date on what's going on with after treatment. If not, get the training, go to the YouTube channel, like I said, get some training on that. Because uh, one of the things that I was surprised as I visited these shops was the pretty much the weakness and understanding how after treatment works. Now, the second thing that I want to hit hard and heavy on is the use of service information. So one of the key things I've been pretty much nailing since January, big time on the, of this year of 2024, has been how competent are you in service information? Uh, because a lot of guys were very weak in finding a lot of the service information, both on some of my other classes and on location classes as well. So please note, if you're an all data user, your Identifix user, your Pro Demand user, you know it's it's something that you guys have to keep in mind that you need to be, you know, know everything. Don't just use the basics of it because it is very common to see for me that these technicians were very weak in finding, you know, these issues and also looking up the service information because there is our troubleshooting charts, there's diagnostic troubleshooting charts, wiring diagrams, technical service bulletins, and so on. So you need to get up to speed. So did you know that those Providers of service information actually give you training that's free that they log into your computer and tell you all the tips and tricks on how to use stuff. So please get up to speed with that. Now, why am I telling you that? 
Well, <clears throat> let me stop a share here. And uh, one of the things that we talk about, um, for example, I've talked to a few shops about, you know, drive cycles with a Ford. Uh, what do you do when a Ford product, a 6.7 especially, uh, what do you do when you actually have a D-rate condition? You're trying to get the truck out of D-rate. And in, in this case, you don't have those nice functions that you see on a Ram pickup or you see on a GM Duramax pickup, you know. So in this case, please note, as I'm scrolling through here, that you do have in the service information, like I use Identifix with the four service information, is again, the drive cycles, right? So in this case, I've been emailing this file to a few people. I told them to look it up, see what's going on. But in this case, there are drive cycles you're supposed to keep in mind or do. And in this case, if you don't do those drive cycles, you're going to be a little frustrated. So finally, some guys figure it out. The worst ones on a Ford are those that are idled. So if you're idled and you're in a, a, a major D-rate condition there and you don't have no code set yet, you need to get it out of D-rate. You need to do the exhaust fluid procedure test. So in this case, I'm not going to go in depth into this, but I will tell you that you have given engine cooling temperatures, ambient air temperatures that you have to meet. You have to drive it at a certain speed, you know. So in this case, this is important to understand. Not to mention, we have to reach the light off temperatures of the catalyst. Whether it being a diesel oxidation catalyst, a NOx catalyst, we need to get these vehicles up to temperature. For example, if you look right there on your screen, step 12 is telling you to monitor the exhaust gas temperature sensors, make sure the exhaust temperature is between 392 to 572 degrees Fahrenheit. It takes a lot to get them that hot for those of you that have experience with this. So in this case, those are prerequisites needed that it, it's needed to actually, again, get this truck to actually pass those monitors and or to get it out of D-rate. So very important to understand. So please note, again, the service information has a lot of this stuff that you need to look for. Obviously, I do give my email. I do give my phone number where I've actually have helped guys where to find it. However, though, you got to get fluent on your service information on where and what's located at. Now, when I use Identifix, Identifix actually has, you know, the OE service information. Now, why do I bring that up? Because uh, just for word to the wise, again, good stuff from the manufacturers. This is the description and the inspection guideline. This is an inspection guideline that actually is in the RAM um, Tech Authority website that's available through Identifix. Not that I'm trying to plug Identifix, but in this case, they're going to show you the pickup models and the cab chassis models, right? No big deal. But in this case, you're going to see, again, there's the designs of each one outlined in each component, right? But you're, one thing that a lot of guys don't realize is that the Ram Cummins is a uniquely special after-treatment system, like we mentioned before, because on number eight, let me pull this back up a little bit. Number eight, if you read carefully, that's actually your ASC catalyst, S-E-R slash ASC, a.k.a. known as ammonia slip catalyst. Now, in pr past... Uh, pretty much webinars, we've been talking about ammonia slip. And if you still don't know ammonia slip, I'll go over it real quickly, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it. But then again, I got technicians that still struggle with the fact that when that death fluid of 32.5% urea mixed with water gets injected, it readily has a chemical reaction where it turns changes into ammonia. So therefore, the Ram Cummins applications use an ammonia slip catalyst. So that's also described in the service information, but then they tell you how to inspect. They take it a step further, and I've been talking about this ever since day one back in 07 about, you know, checking the inlet because I'm a big advocate of uncorking the exhaust to, because if you have issues with the after treatment, for example, premature loading of the DPF, one of the things you want to do is take a look at that inlet of that DOC, but also the DPF as well. And you can see the carbon well, which I'll show you a picture of one that I did too as well. So therefore, they're telling the inspections. Now, we have seen, like when I was at another shop, we actually had some DPF and DOCs and NOx catalysts where we were seeing evidence of coolant. It turns out that the vehicle had a minute head gasket issue occurring. In other words, starting to pressurize the uh, coolant. And at that point, we had coolant in the exhaust, which is going to poison and bombard that, uh, you know, pretty much the DOCs, the DPFs, and the NOx reducing catalysts. So again, what I'm trying to focus on here at this moment on this presentation is take advantage and spend some time after hours or your lunch hour, whatever it is, and go ahead and look at what the service information provides. Know it well where everything is found. And this is an example of what's available for you to see in the service info. 
So in this case, then they get into the SER system. You all know about the crystallization of that fluid. And in this case, you know, you're going to see that we have issues where we see the clogging. Oh, and by the way, you're going to find that many manufacturers are actually showing you a clean, there's a cleaning option of the uh, reductant injector or death fluid injector and where they're flushing it with death fluid to loosen some of this crystallization. I'll be honest with you. I've had zero success with that. And if you've had success, let me know, but I haven't had no success in that, which in turn means that there are some shops that are ultrasonic cleaning these uh, injectors, these reductant injectors, and some are just replacing, them, which is all understandable. So here's good ideas of what's available from the service info. Again, again, Ram does a good job of showing you all these different issues that can happen, especially with that fluid. Okay, so very important. So once again, I'm not trying to, you know, scare you, but, but you need to make time to actually what? You need to use what's available in the service information. And one thing I will, one of the future webinars I hope to teach here is going to be that I realize is a technical service bulletins. I can't tell you how many uh, technicians also don't even bother to look at technical service bulletins. So, so let's just throw it into the gun right here. If we have an LML, now we're going to mention it right now. I'm going to have you think about it. Then we're going to answer it later on as I move along here. But, you know, one of the trucks that I came across recently is the vehicle is derated at 50 miles per hour, if I remember correctly. It was 50, if I remember correctly. The SER light is on. And in this case, we run an exhaust fluid quality test on this LML Duramax, and they're still in D-rate and there's no codes, okay? So the frustration the shop had was that they couldn't get it out of D-rate. They reflashed it too, because I told them, did you have the latest flash file, which is a common thing that we see. In this case here, you can see the scan that I did, which is a 22.9F, okay? So therefore, you know, what do you do? You know, the truck is derated. You go ahead and uh, try to run a exhaust fluid quality test, which is a NOx test, because this relates to the SCR side of the after treatment. Now, the truck runs okay. It runs great. There's no issues. However, though, she's derated 50 miles an hour. This was a very popular phone call back in the day, back in, you know, 2012, 2013, I used to get. And now I see this, and I'm like, okay, you guys are not quite up to speed in this. So there, But note, there are no DTCs. Okay, there's no codes. So why would I run exhaust fluid quality test again? Because we're trying to verify NOx reduction. Because obviously, the SER light is on. That relates to NOx. That's why I like to refer to it as a NOx light. So therefore, what else is going on? There's no codes. So the computer has found no issues at this point. But then, what are the conditions that we need to run properly exhaust fluid quality test? Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to it. Because we're going to put a little puzzles together here. Now, as, an, as a quick take here, let's understand something. If you haven't had an after-treatment training, is remember, when we talk about diesel emissions, we're talking about NOx, oxides of nitrogen, which relate to our control by pre- and post-controls, our EGR and SER, right? SER, again, for those of you new, selective catalyst reduction. And the other side of the after-treatment is particulate matter. We're trying to trap the soot. Now, I'll be honest with you, <laughs> in my opinion, <coughs> I don't care for SER, you know, and because SER has a lot of issues, but the particulate filter side of it, yeah, I agree with it. <clears throat> we see a benefit there, but SER has so many issues going on with it. But for now, what are the two emissions that obviously EPA, the manufacturers are struggling, struggling. And why am I saying struggling is because we're seeing manufacturers cheat, right? And if they're cheating, that means they're struggling to meet these emission guidelines that are enforced by the government themselves so this but when it comes to particulate matter let's get it clear we've talked about it before but i want to get it out of the way is that the number one cause for premature suit loading of a dpf has been blow by gases that is the number one okay and like i've said before in previous training it seems that the diesel repair industry has accepted blow by no, it's not acceptable. Hell, I even put on my YouTube channel where I'm showing my six liter, which is showing minimal blow by, you know, and because I maintain the holy heck out of it. So the most important thing to understand is if you got DPF related issues, again, what is the blow by in this? Now, if you've seen my videos, you probably have seen how I address that issue, which has been known to help 70 to 80% of the time to blow by gases. In other words, and that always mean that it has, needs an in-frame, a rebuild? No. It could also mean that we can loosen that carbon around the rings on the piston. But the bottom line is, 
you know, blow by gases are your number one enemy. Now, if that engine has major wear and tear, it has been poorly maintained, and it has less than 120,000 miles, then you know what the issue is there. So in this case, when you do, and the worst vehicles that I get in the shop that I hate are those that are broken down. I can't crank them over. Maybe it needs an engine. Maybe it needs heads, head gasket, turbo, whatever. And the problem is when I give a quote to the customer, the question begs, okay, it's going to be this much money to do the repair, but this is not going to repair your vehicle completely. Because I know that if I have a poison oil-soaked, coolant-soaked after treatment system, that means what? Well, that means that, you know, we probably need to replace the after treatment or send it out for cleaning. Who knows what sensors are working, not working? I don't know. <clears throat> so what could be a $5,000 repair ticket is going to turn into another three, four, whatever thousand dollar repair ticket. So those are the nightmare ones. And I sympathize with you guys, shops that are going through this. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, uh, be aware of uh, what's going on. And when you do a general major repair on a vehicle, such as injectors as well. So there are other causes for premature loading, obviously. What is the oil and fuel additives that are non-approved? You know, they're not approved at all. So therefore, you know, what is being used? You got to have a little conversation with the customer and ask them, hey, what is it that you are using in the fuel or using in the oil that can actually affect? Obviously, sulfur-based compounds that are heavy and sulfur-based are not good and other issues too as well. But then we still got that customer that likes to use that transmission fluid, use Jet A, Jet B, which I'll mention to again later. But again, then we got uh, pretty much inferior injectors being sold out there, junk injectors. You know, you remember the saying as it goes, you get what you paid for. So in this case, if it's a cheap injector, you know, who's the one that rebuilt it? In this case, we got to watch out for injector performance, which we have seen at length. And if you've been dealing with Denso injectors, you probably know what I'm talking about. Then you got engine management, right? What about bias sensors? You got ECM, PCM issues along with power and ground and all that stuff. So... And obviously, intake issues such as MAP MAP. And if you've been playing with the Duramax L5P, you probably know about the MAP sensor issues about carbon coating, right? But then changing back to NOx again, again, particulate filters and going NOx, we're going hand in hand here. When we're diagnosing NOx concentration issues, first of all, let me just briefly mention because it throws technicians for a loop. When we talk about NOx concentration is how much NOx is actually being measured by the NOx-1, NOx-2, or NOx-3 sensor, depending on what application we're talking about. So therefore, you know, we're looking at understanding how NOx is reduced. So again, we talked about this before of how the after treatment works with SER. We inject that DEF fluid. That DEF fluid is going to go ahead and reduce, break up the NOx. However, though, there are three methods in diagnosing NOx reduction issues, fueling, yeah, fueling doesn't play a role. So you have to understand how NOx is created, right? NOx is created by high combustion temperature that usually exceeds over 2,500 degrees, period. So if you have an issue where you're generating too much NOx, you need to look at first what's coming out of the engine, okay? What's coming out of the engine. So here we got NOx 1, we got NOx 2. We're going to show you a diagram here, which we've shown before, but we're going to talk in detail what they are doing. So therefore, we need to keep in mind how much NOx is coming out of the engine, especially. Then we're going to see what's coming out of the SER after treatment. Now, as you will see in the diagrams, I was I like to use Duramax as the example between LML and L5P for the simple reason that they changed the location of that SER assembly. And that kind of explains a lot of what's going on. However, though, let me pause for a second. When I first started teaching after treatment back in 07, 06, 07, you know, one of the key things I saw, because we learned this from catalytic converters on gasoline applications, was heat, right? Heat. We say this term called light off. Light off means to reach the operating temperature of a catalyst. So heat is a big deal, okay? We got to get them nice and hot. So when I first looked, for example, of a 2007 2500 Cummins application with a 6.7 back in 07, I saw that, you know, here you got this DLC, you got the, and they were really downstream of the exhaust. I'm like, how in the hell are these things going to get hot? So you got to really get them nice and hot for them to do their job because they have a light off temperature, right? If you don't reach that light off temperature, then you're not going to get anything done. Now, we just saw a glimpse of it with the drive cycles that I just showed you on the Ford, which is calling you to be, you know, above 300, 400 plus degrees up to 590 something, right? So therefore, those are the preconditions. 
And to be honest with you, I've been in, you know, like I was in Albany, New York years ago in the cold weather. And I'm lucky if I can get those EGTs to go over 202, 205. You know, it wasn't easy. So cold weather can play against you as well. But let's stick to what we're talking about. So again, we see that NOx is created by high combustion temperature, which again, is 2,500 degrees. So therefore, think about something. If the fuel strategy in the computer is running more richer, or in other words, more fuel being injected than is really needed, is that going to generate more NOx? Well, when you in diesel, when you run more rich, you get hotter, you get more power. But at the same time, though, you're generating more heat. So therefore, an injector that is dribbling, for example, or is leaking, is that going to cause higher NOx levels? Yeah. Now, believe it or not, one of the things that I've been doing teaching now, especially when I teach L5P, or you can use mode six in the Ford applications has been to go ahead and look at misfires. Okay. If you got an issue, you can look at misfires, which can also lead to high NOx issues. So fueling and NOx go hand in hand. So therefore that's why the NOx sensor is also known as an oxygen sensor, because it does a similar job to help us give feedback on where that fuel strategy is at. And let me tell you, some of the programs aren't that smart. So we have to use, again, misfires, fuel trims, uh, <clears throat> fuel calibrations, and so on. And sometimes the best thing you can do if you've got a major NOx issue is reset the fuel adaptive parameters on whatever applications you're working on. Good information there. So then we got sticking to NOx. We got the EGR. Everybody knows about the EGR. But you know what? I don't really worry too much about the EGR when it comes to its performance because it is heavily monitored. The mass airflow sensor, you know, is monitoring the flow when the EGR is open. So he knows the position of it. So he knows if he's got flow. So I like to use the onboard computer, the PCM-ECM, to actually tell me what the EGR is doing. However, though, I do understand about the carbon that EGR brings on the intakes. Like if you've been working on a lot of 6.7, just get right behind the EGR throttle plate on that driver's side of the engine right there where it comes out of the, uh, where it goes towards from the, uh, pretty much the charger cooler, right? So in this case, we get a lot of carbon. That's been the big thing going on, right? But in this case, again, the EGR is heavily monitored for those NOx conditions. So you will set codes and you will have errors that you're going to see there. And obviously, you know, SER is the other guy. So as I mentioned before, you got to know your lights. That was my previous slide that I continue to use this because guys still in my classes, whether in shop or in shop training or in seminars that I'm doing now, it is funny. I ask guys, what is that light right there used for, right? So in this case, that is a NOx light. And anytime, for those of you who never had training on this, if you see that light, that light is telling you one of two things. Like I've said before, it is telling you right there that you have a what? You got a NOx issue. And when you, and, and I guess what I'm trying to say is when you see that light, that must tell you NOx, period. That's all it's got to tell you right off the bat, right? Now, we all are accustomed that when we see the check engine light, right, the mill light, malfunction indicator lamp, we're accustomed to seeing that, hey, it's got a code set. You're right. But I like to take it a step further because for the longest time I've been teaching that what is a diagnostic trouble code? It's a test. I know that a test has failed in the eyes of the PCM ECM. However, though, we got to understand that that SER light, aka to me, that's a NOx light that's telling me one of two things. And what are those one of those two things, like I've said before, has been I'm not able to reduce NOx or haven't been able to validate NOx reduction. Always remember that. Now, I know in the multiple message window you see at the bottom, you're going to see the exhaust fluid quality poor. Many models out there, and this truck specifically is LML Duramax, where we took this from, does not have the capability of testing the death fluid. However, it infers that it, you know, since it's got an NOx issue, it might have poor quality death, but it doesn't mean that. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It can mean other issues too. So for now, like I said before, when you look at this light, <clears throat> that is telling you that you have what? A NOx issue. Always remember that. So knowing what is needed for NOx verification. So the onboard computer is programmed to check for NOx, obviously, right? But in this case, you have to understand that, again, the computer makes the final decision. I could look at NOx parts per million all I want, look at the one pre and post and say, oh yeah, I see a reduction. But I don't make the decision. The computer is going to make the decision whether it clears the code or whether it gets it out of D-rate. That's up to him. 
So you can't do nothing about it. You can't manipulate that. Again, you could just read the data of what Knox is doing, but you can't do anything. So you got to meet those conditions to try to figure out what is the computer seeing that it will not get it out of D rate like that 22.9F that I just showed you as we started this presentation. Very important to understand. So <clears throat> pre-SER, Duramax can applications can set codes for pre-SER. What do I mean by pre-SER? In other words, like I said earlier, a Duramax will set codes for high NOx concentration, better known as NOx performance or SER performance. Excuse me. Let me stop again. Stop, stop. Start again. The Duramax will set codes for excess NOx concentration at NOx sensor 1. Okay, or 11, whatever you want to call it. So in this case, that is the amount of exhaust that's coming out of that engine right at the turbo downpipe or somewhere after the turbo pre-SER. And what it's telling you is, hey, I'm seeing too much NOx. And I'm like, well, that'd be great. I hear I have this diagnostic trouble code for NOx sensor 1 performance, right? And the thing is, if you follow the troubleshooting chart, it's going to tell you to take the intake. It's going to tell you to check the exhaust. And then finally, the fourth or fifth step, step is going to say, replace NOx sensor. That is the crappiest code that I've ever come across with for troubleshooting because it didn't fix it. And I knew that one day when SCR came out around 2011, that we would probably learn some numbers. And what I mean by that is, Okay, here I'm looking at my scan tool and I see NOx sensor one, NOx sensor two. What is too much NOx on NOx sensor one, right? Or 11, whatever you want to call it. Now, what's too much? I mean, I don't know. You know, you see all these numbers from all these trucks, but again, the manufacturers never gave us a average number. And there must have been a number. I knew I said that, but, you know, I said, well, we're going to look play with a lot of trucks and we're going to figure out how we're going to, you know, determine if there is too much NOx. But I'll get to that in a minute. But then you got post-SER. And this is, means what is the NOx levels or concentration after the whole SER def fluid ammonia assembly, right? What is we see? And we can see as little as almost close to zero, you know, parts per minute. I will give that one away. But what about the, you know, the pre-SER? So in this case, we have to know that as we're diagnosing these trucks. However, let's get one thing clear, though, before I go into the slide, is that I hope you understand, and I've talked about this in previous webinars, is the fact that you should know that that engine needs to be running at optimum levels. Because if you're trying to clear a light where it's NOx concentration code, and this engine has crappy injectors, low compression in one cylinder, turbo issues, it's going to be, now I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's going to be pretty hard to actually get that light to go away. And if you do, it may come around back again. So keep that in mind. Now, when we talk about NOx real quick, a little general information here as, we, as we're talking about NOx is please note that a trivia question I ask in my, in my training has been, hey, you guys see the NOx? What does the X mean? Well, there's many variables of oxides of nitrogen. Here you can see some that I got off some websites, you know, and in this case, you know, you see N203, uh, N205, N204, you see all of these, but in reality, EPA only regulates nitrogen dioxide, which is NO2, but there are many variations of NOx. But what you need to understand is that as nitrogen and oxygen come into the intake, because we know that 78% of what's in the atmosphere is nitrogen, less than 18% is oxygen. Yes, we live in a nitrogen-rich environment, but those two are separate. But when we get them in the combustion process and it gets hot over 2,500 degrees, right, we actually create NOx. Again, various variations, but again, the government is only trying to regulate NO2, which is, again, nitrogen dioxide. Now, quick note, too, as well, it is broken down in the stratosphere and it catalyzes the breakdown of the ozone. So what is so bad about NOx? It's that it actually goes after the ozone, which, as you know, uh, protects again out from the earth from UV rays. I don't know about you, but you know, if you want, I'm not going to here give you the tree hugger thing, but in this case, just understand, are we seeing changes in our weather? Jesus, I go, we had like five, eight days of 120, 122 degrees. So, but I won't get into that. So when it all comes down to it is he can work against us, but work with us too as well. So typical temperatures, like I've been saying already, where NOx is created is 2,500 degrees. And if you do understand the combustion process in a diesel, you know that it is easily 
attained 2,500 degrees in normal, in normal diesel operation. That's why you see a lot of these trucks now, as you look at the new engines that are released now since 22, now to 24, now 25, is that we see the actual uh, compression ratios drop. But as much as compression ratios are dropping, guess what we're doing to keep the power? We're boosting. Because what they're trying to do is meet NOx levels at idle, right? So if you're not boosting at idle, you can reduce the NOx by reducing the compression, which means less heat, less NOx is created. But you still create NOx but because it's part of the combustion process. So there you go. So the EGR does assist. That's why you still see the EGR won't go away. It's still there. And in this case, EGR assists in NOx reduction by recirculating those inert gases to actually be subcooled and cool down the combustion process. So that's, as you know, EGR does work there. Because let's face it, when you're idling, that's where you create quite a bit of NOx too as well, because again, you're just idling. That's why, you know, a lot of even class A applications, you're going to see they're trying to get rid of you idling for long periods of time. Now, when I look at different applications, for example, I, I critique the power, uh, excuse me, the RAM 6.7, as you can see in the picture. Uh, the reason why is because even during a regeneration, they are opening that EGR valve, which is number five right there. In this case, I don't understand. And those of you that worked on these trucks long enough have seen that trucks with, you know, over 150,000 plus, where we see that tube number four, we see it clogged with carbon, right? So in this case, we definitely have EGR and EGR flow codes. And you've probably seen the intakes full of carbon. I, you know, we, I've taken care of tow trucks and oh my God, we see them carboned up like you wouldn't believe. You know? So therefore you probably know about the EGR coolers on these applications as well. So the bottom line is, you know, the EGR is recircling those gases back into the intake, which is at five, and it goes into the intake. But then we create a low pressure using a throttle plate, which is number six, right? So in this case, that's what we're doing there. But again, I trust very much the onboard diagnostics because, again, the computer does monitor mass airflow and also monitors the EGR position to determine the operation of the EGR valve. So it does work pretty damn good. Now, let's get them thing clear as we're talking about host controls in the SER. Now, as you can see, once again, like we were starting to talk about, let's get something clear. NOx 11, as you can see, is number one, and NOx 12 is number one there on this application. So we're looking at a what? We're looking at a, let's see, what am I looking at? I'm trying to get my mind back into this. This is an LML. Okay, this is an LML Duramax. I decided to use it because they, they switch between LML and FIP. I'll get to this here in a second. Number three is showing you, again, the path of exhaust flow. So number 14 is what? That is our hydrocarbon injector. We haven't talked about hydrocarbon injectors in a long time, but I think most of you got it, that if you don't reach those light-off regen temperatures, it's telling you it's not actually contributing a lot of fuel. And those of you that are still running stock, those trucks with the CP4 pump, you probably understand that they get contaminated and they get clogged and restricted. Again, we're talking about the hydrocarbon injector number four. But what I like about this is the fact that if I have a truck that does not get a lot of drive time, maybe it does stop and go, it's a delivery truck. Sometimes what we have to do is we have to run a regeneration. So when you run a regeneration on LML, Number 14, which is the hydrocarbon injector, is going to go ahead and heat through the use of the desoxidation catalyst, which is number three. And what it's going to do is you're going to see that it heats along the, again, the DEF injection, but also the NOx reducing catalyst. So please remember, number four is a NOx reducing catalyst. So when guys are struggling to get this truck to reduce NOx and they still get NOx concentration code set, they tend to forget that there's a NOx reducing catalyst. I mean, I'll get a phone call, Tony, we've done the pump, we've done the def fluid injector, you know, we've run regeneration, we can't get the NOx to go down. And turns out that, you know, the NOx catalyst may be poison. So therefore that can be your issue. So don't forget again about number four, if you're taking notes about your NOx issues, in other words, excuse me, NOx issues, your NOx catalyst, because that also assists in reducing that NOx as needed. So once again, number 13 is your reductant injector and there's your ammonia being created. So as we've been discussing, 32.5% urea with water is gonna go ahead and have a chemical reaction once in the hot 
hot, heated exhaust, it's going to go ahead and turn into ammonia. So NH3 is ammonia, and it is the ammonia that breaks up the NOx with number four with the NOx reducing catalyst. Guys, if you don't know that, you need to learn that. So those of you watching the recording, play it back again, this segment, play it back and learn it, because I can't tell you how many guys don't know that, okay, in shops that I've gone to. So the reason why also is, can you have such a thing as ammonia slip? Yeah, we'll get into that here in a second. However, though, as you are looking at the death fluid being injected, turned into ammonia, you're going to see once again that there is number one again, which is NOx 1, 2. So we're looking at the NOx levels, how much they drop. Okay. Obviously, in the scan tool, you're going to see this actually, you know, change. So remember, heat is essential. I cannot stress that enough. Heat is essential. So what I mean by heat is that you need to get it nice and hot. Okay. So therefore, you saw those light off temperatures we mentioned earlier that even we saw in the drive cycles. In order to get this to work correctly, we need to get it nice and hot. Now, what the customer does when they're driving, that's another thing. But for us as diagnostic technician to get rid of a message, to get rid of an issue, yeah, we need to get it nice and hot. So on the LML, as we were starting to talk about on this slide on number 14, that is your friend right there because that's going to run a regeneration event. That hydrocarbon injector is going to heat up that whole after treatment system and it'll help you again, get rid of any excess ammonia slip that you may have. So therefore, it also heats those catalysts to further reduce the NOx. Because again, if that exhaust is too cold, it ain't going to do anything. Okay, so therefore your NOx levels are going to be what? Way high to the point that you get a NOx concentration code set. So there you go. So I've shown this slide before. This is the best slide I have from Ram Cummins. But you're going to notice right there, you actually have the ammonia slip catalyst. Okay. So the Cummins is the only of the big three is the only one that uses an ammonia slip catalyst that I'm aware of at this time. So on the V8s, that is, and the big engines. So therefore, the ammonia slip catalyst is absorbing excess ammonia that's left over. So if, we, if you've been following previous, again, webinars, we've been talking about ammonia slip, which is the ammonia that is not used in the conversion process of reducing NOx. That's what ammonia slip is, excess ammonia. That's why some people have called me, and I've seen it too, where we run a regeneration on a truck, and it smells, the exhaust smells like Windex, right? Windex glass cleaner, because that's ammonia that you're smelling there. However, like I've talked about before, remember, ammonia can fool NOx sensor uh, 1, 2, or the last NOx sensor, because of the fact that the sensor cannot distinguish the difference between ammonia and NOx, which will in turn cause more death fluid to be injected and increase, and increase more ammonia slip. So what is the cure usually to fix this? Is to get it nice and hot. Better yet, run a regeneration on these models. So let's go back to this truck here. <clears throat> we talked about the 229F, right? So as we talk about this 229F, again, refreshing your memory as I started this presentation, we talked about the fact that the truck is in D-rate at 50 miles per hour, and obviously it's going to get worse and eventually get idle, but you got no codes, but you do have an SCR light. So like I said, the SCR light is telling me one of two things. A, I haven't been able to reduce NOx, or B, again, I haven't been able to validate if there is indeed NOx reduction. So, but I got no codes but the SCR light is on. You're like, well, why? So we ran the exhaust fluid quality test, which checks for NOx and it didn't do anything. However, though, I got curious. When I started looking at the data and as I'm running, I'm looking all the data. And when I look at data, I look at mass airflow map, temperatures and so on. And I got to engine coolant temperature and I saw that the engine coolant temperature, while even after I ran the exhaust fluid quality test, was staring at me around 153 to 158 degrees. What is engine operating temperature on a Duramax? Well, you want to be above 185. I'm looking, this thing's running cold, which is classic thermostat issue, right? And uh, the technician I was working with, I said, let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and just beat the heck out of this truck. Let's get her hot. We managed to reach about 182, 183, not quite at 180 because we're running it hard. Let's now run the exhaust fluid quality test. So we ran the exhaust fluid quality test. At that point, it set a code. You know, so in this case, it set a code. And in this case, it was the 229F that set. Okay, that's where I got that code. 
So in this case, what I'm giving away now is I did not have that code initially. If you didn't read this correctly, I had no codes when I first started, but I didn't get this code to come back until I reached over 183 degrees of engine coolant temp. And the funny thing is the exhaust fluid quality test ran and it even said in the data on my tech two, it said that it passed, right? But in this case, not really. It was running too cold. So go figure. So they could tell you what's how reliable the software is. So with that said, now I have a NOx sensor circuit range performance code. Okay. So therefore, that's what you're looking at now. So I got something. So it's actually bank one, which is sensor one. Y'all follow me? So in this case, that's where we're at. So therefore, they're saying that we got a NOx sensor issue. Again, bank one. So as I pull the code out, right? I'm looking at the code. Now I could get into this and this is another scenario. Again, it's NOx sensor two performance. Again, it's two, NOx sensor two performance. So this is the one after the SER. So what that telling me is that I don't have enough reduction of NOx, right? But one thing I wanna show you here, this is why I'm a big advocate about reading diagnostic trouble codes. First of all, there are conditions for setting the code. It says there that the ECM receives a serial data message for NOx concentration for NOx sensor one and NOx sensor two during the test phase. The delta NOx concentration NOx sensor two is calculated. If the delta is less than five parts per million, the diagnostic fails. The test phase begins during a tip and acceleration event. A tip and acceleration event when the conditions for render code are satisfied and it completes it in 10 seconds. So if you're fortunate to clear the code, let's say I do clear the code, and by the way, he did clear the code, what do we have to do? Well, we can run a hot reductant fluid quality test, or you can simulate the conditions for, for setting the code. So if I want to run this test, we understand that, A, I could look at NOx sensor 1, NOx sensor 2 parts per million, but I can also you know, provide the tip-in acceleration event and complete it all within 10 seconds. That's why. If you have a GM, close to GM uh, type of scan tool, what I mean by that closely has the advantages of what GM offers is that now you're going to use the DTC specific DTC info. You're going to look at, did it run that test on that ignition cycle to verify you did test for this code? Because you got to make sure that code went away. So therefore, under DTCs, you're going to click on specific DTC and you're going to type in that 229F if you have this code and you're going to see did it pass on this event that I just did to make sure that it did pass or it failed, right? Now, please note them. This is why we got to read and know our codes. You're going to see there that under action taken or even conditions for clearing the code, it's telling you that the DTC 229F is a type B DTC. So what's a type B DTC? Those of you that ever had training on this, a type B code means it has to occur in two consecutive ignition cycles. So therefore, I'll drive the truck, I'll do those conditions, I'll see if it ran the test, but it won't, let's say it failed. You're like, well, it failed. I could see it on the specific DTC that it did fail this ignition. Why did it not turn on the check engine light? Because it's waiting for its second consecutive. So you turn the ignition off, wait about 20, 30 seconds, turn the vehicle back on, go drive it, simulate these conditions again, that tip and acceleration. And now if it does fail again, then you have an official code set. So a lot of you that haven't had training on type A and type B codes, you need to understand that the type B code requires two ignition drive cycles, which are most of the codes found. GM does tell us here that it is available there, as you can see there. So so therefore, again, please note, the exhaust gas temperature sensors need to be hot. Your DPF DLC needs to be hot. But again, now that we're dealing with a code, then at this point, we need to make sure we verify that it is indeed failing. Now, let's say we found that the issue on this truck is if we follow the 229F and it'll lead us to another link, to another link, it's going to tell us to test the reductant injector the stream test, the volume test, then you test the quality of the DEF fluid. A lot of you know this already. However, though, let's say I found a bad reductant injector, right? You replace the reductant injector, you put it back in, the 229F is still there. So therefore you can run a reductant fluid quality test, but at the same time, you can validate the repair by again, satisfying the conditions for setting the code to make sure that code does not come back. So another reason why to follow the diagnostic trouble codes. 
Now, when I first was starting teaching about NOx reduction with SCR, we found out that, yes, GM and RAM do give you the ability to tell the computer, hey, go ahead and run a NOx test. That's what it is in reality. So RAM calls it a catalyst efficiency test. They just updated the name. I forgot what the new name is. If you know it, put it on the on the, on the the chat there. But GM actually has called it the reductant fluid quality test on the LML and anti-tamper test also on the L5P. So Ford, no, there is nothing. Now, I haven't played with a 22 or newer trucks. So I couldn't tell you. I don't know if they've changed that. However, though, <clears throat> What I'm trying to say is that, Ford, you got to run drive cycles, okay? And you got to, like I showed you earlier, and if you want me to show it to you, I'll show it to you here in a little bit, but you have the ability to tell the computer test for NOx reduction. That's what it is for. But don't run these tests if you have code set, unless they are to the D rate condition you may have. Now, if you got an SER, uh, let's say you got an EGT code, you got a SER pressure code, you got various, anything associated with the SER system. No, it's not going to run the test. Use your brain. Hello. How is it going to work with low pressure on the DEF fluid? How's it going to work with a bad heater? How's it going to work with a bad reductant injector? No, you've got to have no codes related to the SER components, right? So got to make sure we have that. So therefore, yes, you can go ahead and test for that very carefully by watching the NOx reduction. Now, I've been talking about NOx, right? But let's get back to heat like I've been talking about here. So is the thermostat, first of all, performance essential to reach an operating temperature? Yes, for two reasons. Like we just saw was, you know, we saw the code not set because it didn't meet certain parameters. But what about fueling? Just fueling alone. If we're fueling too much, what did we say earlier? We're going to create more NOx, not to mention the calibration of the computers designed to a more rich strategy at colder temperatures versus at operating temperatures, right? So therefore, does that affect NOx? Yeah. So we have to understand light off too as well. This is the operating temperature where the catalysts are rated. So this is again over 590, but you're gonna see that they're asking you to get above 400 degrees. We saw that already with the drive cycles. But then comes another important one, is engine calibration changes again, well, not a new one, excuse me. Engine calibration changes from cold to warm to operating temperature above 185. That's a repeat of what I just started with the first bullet. So with that said, the issue with the vehicle with DRA with no codes was cool. It never reached, you know, it always reached up to 158, but that was it. I need to change that, sorry. So therefore, well, upon reaching over 180, 183, we were able to get that 229F, which was a knock sensor to performance code. But my point is, it looks like I did a lousy job on this slide. My apologies. However, though, my point is, do you need it hot? Yes, you need it hot for fuel calibrations, for and light off temperatures. Yes, we need that for it to run the code. Remember, with that truck, we didn't have no codes. We ran the we, we, we ran the uh, exhaust fluid quality test and it passed. However, though, it was running around 153. But once we got it over 180, 183, 185, we got it to set the 229F. So temperature is very important. And like I showed you earlier on the Cummins um, DOC DPF uh, diagnostic ch chart that I showed you earlier, you're going to see this is an actual truck that we did that we uncorked the exhaust. And this is the inlet of the DOC, not the DPF. And you're going to see, um, hopefully it's clear on your screen, but it's almost potato chip thin layer of carbon. Now, if you understand how carbon is formed, carbon is a quenching effect. And a quenching effect means that it actually, what's the word I'm looking for? It pretty much solidifies itself from a vapor to a solid right there. So it condenses itself in a way to the point that it actually creates a blockage right there. So, and the thing is, as you throw more fuel against that inlet of that DOC, it absorbs, it's like charcoal that absorbs lighter fluid, if you will. And in this case, it just builds and builds more carbon. So I was happy to see from this, again, this chart that I showed you, let me stop the share here and change over for those of you that, that are just came in on here, was that I was surprised that, you know, even Cummins acknowledged on the Rams website, you know, they acknowledged once again that they saw the carbon formation. So there you can see the SCR that I showed you, but then again, you can see also the issues of the carbon wall forming on the inlet of the DLC. So, it's something that we see, especially those trucks that see a lot of idle time or maybe get driven 
10 miles a day, if that, you know, so they take it to the grocery store and back type of thing and only use it on five weekends a month to take the boat out type of thing, you know, so therefore that's even acknowledged there too. But that tells me, okay, what I'm trying to get to by showing you all these pictures has been that this tells me that this has been running very cold. No light off temperatures have been reached at all. So in this case, that's something that you have to simulate. And I understand, what do you tell that customer that only uses that truck hardly? You know, then therefore we have to be saying, okay, we're going to have to do a regeneration event until so we can actually keep that clean. Or once in a while, like some of you know about this already, is drive the holy bejesus out of this truck, get it all nice and hot. So no fun, I know. But in this case, it is a problem that we see out there with after treatment, on the, especially again, those trucks are not getting hot which will lead also to excessive ammonia slip, you know, so therefore that's going to cause also an ox concentration goes through the grapevine. Now I've shown this video before, but for those of you that haven't seen it, like I said, I'm having a hard time guys understanding that light. So as we, <coughs> excuse me, as we zoom in on here, you're going to see again, understanding your messages right there and what you're looking at is there's the SER light right there. Now look very closely on this dash. Use your brain. Do you see a check engine light on? No. The engine's idling. Look at the idle speed, right? So in this case, what we're just trying to demonstrate, this is something you have to use your brains, is that I see that it's threatening to derate the engine to 50, the vehicle to 50 miles per hour and 44 miles. But immediately, I know this is an SER NOx issue. It's a NOx issue. And I'm like, well, there's no code, so nothing has failed. So that means the computer hasn't been able to what? Validate, okay, that there is NOx reduction. So he needs to be tested. So again, sorry for those who have seen this before, but I'll fast forward it for those of you. Let me go ahead and mute the sound. And what you're going to see is that, you know, what I decide to do is that we run a regeneration. Now, again, just to prove this, because I get a lot of guys that are skeptical, and I hate it when they get skeptical. It's like I'm telling you this from experience. Not that I know it all, but there's no P code set, as you can see there. So there was no uh, power chain or emission related code set. It had U codes and B codes that were for the aftermarket. That's because it was a tow truck. So what I decide to do as I fast forward on this thing is I run a regeneration on this truck. So here we're at the end of the regeneration. You'll see above 1,000, but you're going to see that the message went away. So that even tells me that even during a regeneration event, this computer is monitoring NOx levels. So therefore it was able to see the NOx to concentration go down and it said, okay, I have validated that. So what was the fix for this truck? Literally just ran a regeneration. That's all I did. Obviously, since it was a hot day, it was about 111 degrees. I also sold the customer an oil change because that oil got beaten up to heck. Because for those of you who don't know, this truck does post injections to actually create a, a regen, which tends to dilute the oil a little bit. So therefore we run that. So this was an easy one, okay? But it kind of proves the point that a lot of you are not paying attention to the fact that are we actually getting it nice and hot? So that's very important to understand. So we understand now, and we train on this, and if you don't know, here you go again, is that the death fluid is the ammonia, is the ammonia that breaks up the NOx. So we as a technician must read the NOx in a scan to in parts per million. That's the NOx concentration. However, though, as we are talking about this, I told you that we had to come up with a magic number. And this is the number I came up. So this is a Tony spec because I've never seen a manufacturer giving us. But I do know when I look at NOx sensor one, if you're taking notes, make a note of this. When I look at NOx sensor one, one or what one, the first one, which is right after the turbo. One of the things I look for is where's the NOx levels at now? Again, don't look at the NOx levels when cold. You got to look at it when the engine's at operating temperature above 185 degrees of engine coolant temp. And in this case, I know that if I see a number greater than 300 parts per million, that engine is generating too much NOx. Now, if it is generating too much NOx, I'm going to look at the injector performance. Now, obviously, you've done your basics of diagnostics, right? You've done your basics of diagnostics and, you know, air filter and everything else, you know, everything you're supposed to check. You verified your fuel rail pressures. Now I'm going to look at balancing rates. I'm going to look at volume uh, measurements, the percentage of fuel trim, whatever application it is. I'm going to look at where the fuel is at. 
to understand that. However, though, we're taking it an extra step. Like I said earlier, we're also looking at misfires on a Duramax. We're looking at mode six, looking at Fords to see if there's a misfire going on there. So those of you that have IDS, if you look under your engine, you go scroll down, you're going to get to your uh, powertrain test. You can actually put up mode six there and look for misfires and see what's failing. It'll be highlighted in red. Others that are using like, uh, let's say you're using a, a zoo scan tool or other scan tools, you know, you can see what's going on with mode six as well. So I think what we're going to do coming up here is we'll do a mode six uh, info commercial kind of thing to give you some training on mode six, which the automotive guys have been doing for a long time now. However, though, understand that 300 parts per million is too much coming out. And you will, like I said, Duramax will set codes for excess NOx concentrations right after the turbo itself. But that also tells you that, am I dealing with too much NOx that the SCR has to deal with that has to do too much reduction in NOx? Is it reducing too much, you know? So there you go. So as we've shown before as well, uh, please note there are, depending on the manufacturer, they're almost all the same. But here you can see one on a RAM off their books where they're telling you what can you do with the SCR. Again, the catalyst efficiency test is to ensure an ox reduction. You're telling the computer to run a mini regen and what it's doing is testing to see where the NOx levels are at to ensure they reduce NOx. Now, many RAM trucks that I've had in the past, as soon as I repair, let's say I had a bad pump, a very popular problem on those, I did a def pump, right? I replace, I replace the def pump. At that point, I'm going to go ahead and prime it. And then I'll go ahead and run a catalyst efficiency test. But before I run the catalyst efficiency test, I got to get it nice and hot. Sometimes, as soon as I get it hot, guess what? The D rate went away. Okay, it's back to normal. However, other trucks, the D rate didn't go away. So I, I did everything I'm supposed to do. I ran the catalyst efficiency. It still wasn't D rate. What was the problem? It had to have an update reflash put in it. As soon as I reflashed it, what happened? I ran the catalyst efficiency test. Within four or five minutes, boom, the D rate's gone, right? So therefore, there are many factors to get a vehicle under D rate. They're not consistently the same. And I could have the same model truck and they're all acting different. Don't ask me why. So one cause, like I've said before, has been you got to update the flash file. Two, you got to go ahead and get it warmed up. That'll do it. But if that don't do it, you got to get it warmed up, make sure it's a laser flash file, and run the catalyst efficiency test just to get it out of D-rate. So understanding and knowing what are the challenges is going to make you a better tech, especially on how these trucks handle these emissions. You know, they're derating you because that's what they're supposed to do to get it fixed because you're polluting too much. However, though, when I see a technician immediately try to sell the customer a delete, Deletes are not as glorified as you think they are because, A, the value of the truck when you trade it in, that's one story. Then the story is we got a lot of crappy delete programs out there. I was surprised these last three shops that I visited, they said something I never thought I would hear. They said, Tony, these guys are better off keeping the truck stock than to delete them because of all the issues we've had with deletes. And those of you that have done deletes and seen the aftermath of it probably could relate, right? So issues right there. So again, we understood what ammonia slip is. Again, that is the excess ammonia. So therefore we need to understand that. Now, a quick note on particulates, right? The LMM Duramax book, I always loved the LMM because that's the one that really made me aware about, about particulates, right? And as you may or may not understand, particulates are actually those small microbes of particles that are out there, they're carbon-based particles. So just to give you an understanding from the EPA here has a hair follicle, right? There's your hair. Human hair is about 50 to 70 microns in diameter. And then you can see PM 2.5, which is 2.5 mic microns in diameter. And then you could see PM 10. In other words, microns are rated by the size of the particulates. So think of it as dust, if you will. But the problem is these are, again, carbon-based, which are not healthy for you. So in this case, particulate matter refers to tiny particles of solid or semi-solid material suspended in the atmosphere. This includes particles between 0.1 of a micron to 50 microns in diameter. The heavier they are, the larger they are, obviously. So there you could see the TSB, the PM10, and also the PM2.5. <clears throat> so therefore, particulate matter is a type of airborne pollutant that can include dust, tobacco smoke, diesel emissions, and more. But here's the one thing I'm trying to get across. 
is that when you are, when I see these uh, tractor pulls and these, you know, especially these youngsters that are putting their head over the stack and breathing that in, that's a lot of particulates that you're taking in into your lungs and some of it can get into your bloodstream as well. So therefore, please understand any particles less than 10 micrometers in diameter can travel deep in the lungs and reach the air sacs where they can irritate and damage your lung tissues. So yeah, it's something that I do consider. And that's why when I look at a truck, like an early model truck, like an early uh, RAM application, like a 2008 that only had a DOC and a DPF, it's okay to see that the exhaust is clean, galvanized color. You look at a 6.4, 6.7 that's running right. You know, they all, even with SER, they all are running clean exhaust. So that tells you that the particulates are being trapped and it cleans up our air. So therefore, remember, the TESOL particulate filter is a maintenance item, okay? But what is the average life of the DPF, right? DPFs can last a long time, but again, what was the number one enemy? Is again, oil-based particles, especially from blow-by. And also we see some poisoning taking place with them. So the key to understand is the issue that caused the premature salt loading. I could have a new customer come in, right? And I could see he has a DPF efficiency code set. I ran, I go ahead and inspect the whole engine. I check the fuel trims. I check everything else, see if there's any issues, power balance, everything I'm supposed to do along with intake tests. That's why we believe in smoke testing the intakes. You do all that, right? All right, so everything is good, but then you look at blow-by. Blow-by is pretty excessive. Now, always remember something that a lot of guys don't keep in mind. When you are looking at blow-by, when you take that oil cap off, always remember something. If it's quite excessive and it's like a little, you know, smokestack coming out of that, you know, the oil fill, that's the blow-by when it's under idle, no load. What is the blow-by when it's under a load? So, therefore, that brings about more issues. So in this case, that can prematurely load, you know, the DPF. So we have to look at the big picture. Now, we have seen issues where the customer came and, and said, hey, I'm tired of this shop. Now you guys look at it. They did injectors for me. And ever since I did the injectors, DPF, DPF, and turns out the injectors are the issue. In other words, he got poor quality injectors, which we have seen as well. So therefore, no issues. Like I've said before, it's essential to understand that engine must be running with no issues. Injector, turbo. Engine, anything that causes engine drivability issues cannot cannot be the problem. Yeah. So a quick thing, though, I wanted to say is that, as you know, there is a tube on the inlet and the outlet of the DPF. There's your DPF right here. This is your DLC. This is an LMM Duramax. But what I do want to make sure we all understand, the average number we use to acknowledge, you know, as you're diagnosing these trucks, is that how do I know? that the DPF is loaded. Let's say, hey, I'm inspecting the engine. I got no code set, but let's see where the DPF is at. You can look at the grams, but I don't like to look at the grams because that's a calculation. The estimated suit load, as we call it. I like to look at <coughs> the differential pressure. Where is your differential pressure at? The magic number we like to use is around three PSI. Okay, and this is at idle. I'll give it RPM two at idle. Give it some RPM if you reach three PSI. Yes, that's pretty loaded. One of the things that I've been advising shops to do, and I've been talking about this for a long time, has been if a truck comes in for an oil change, just an oil change service, you know, is it advisable to run a regeneration if possible on that truck? The answer is yes, because I want that customer to leave with a clean DPF. Now, if that pressure differential is less than 0.5 of a PSI, yeah, it's clean. We'll leave it alone. But if it's got two or plus, you know, yeah, I think we're going to run one. But if you want to know if it's got loading going on, look at the PSI, no more than how much? Three PSI. That's what you want to look for there. Okay. So here's an example. There you can see on the scan tools, I'm running regeneration. This is an old one. This is an oldie but a goodie. But you can see that the suit mass is at six grams. That's a calculation. But I do have 1.1 PSI of pressure variance between the inlet and the outlet of the DPF. So again, that tells me that we definitely don't have a lot of pressure. It's under three, quite a lot. So I could run a regeneration, but I'm not necessarily going to run one. But here you can see the one I've been showing in my after treatment class. Some of you have seen this before, but here you can see that the suit mass is 83 grams. It is loaded. You know, it's over 30. And you could see that the pressure variance is 3.4 PSI. But as I run the regeneration, right, you're going to see that the pressure is dropping. But the one thing that I have not mentioned before on, on previous uh, webinars has been the fact that 
you're going to see the temperatures. Now, let's look at the temperatures on the example right here. You're going to see the example showing inlet temperature of 1080. So that's the heat that's being generated through the DOC and the exothermic reaction we're creating there. But look at the temperature after is 895. So in this case, when I see a cooler temperature than inlet temperature on the DPF, that's telling me that nothing's going on. In other words, you're supposed to be burning. So should it be warmer or hotter after the DPF? Yes, you can see 11, 12 coming in here on the left, but there's 12, 27 degrees afterwards. So yeah, we're cooking. And then you can see on the right-hand side, 11, 39, we're running even warmer now. And we're hitting 1270. So we're definitely cooking in this application right here. However, though, here's the question I will ask you guys. You're welcome to put it on the chat right there. Is that what is too hot on a regeneration? In other words, what is that? Where should you actually get a little scared that it's getting too hot? Anybody know what degrees? Actually, I'll give it to you right now for time's sake. It's actually 1400 degrees. When you start getting over 1400, you better start puckering up. Because one thing I've created a term is called uh, DPF runaway. I call it DPF runaway for the simple fact that we've had trucks that were poisoned with something that's not supposed to be in that DPF that's burning so hot that it exceeds 1,400 degrees. And let me tell you, it's a helpless feeling. You don't, you feel helpless because of the fact that you can't do nothing about it. You're going to have to let itself hopefully burn itself out, but it destroys the after treatment or the DPF, especially the DOC. So in this case, what I'm trying to say is be aware that when you're running regeneration, if it kicks out prematurely, let's say you're running regen, within 10, 15 minutes, it's back to idle again. Look at your EGT temperatures and see where they're at. Because if they're high, especially of approaching 1,400 degrees, yeah, you better start saying, oh, this is a poison DPF. So what's the fix? Remove the whole assembly and send it out for cleaning and see what they have to say. Sometimes I get a call back from our DPF servicing people. And they'll tell us that it's it's not repairable, need a new one. And in some cases, they've been able to clean them. So that has happened as well. Okay? So therefore, be aware of that. Now, when you look at a Ford, I, I kind of laugh at a Ford because on a Ford, they make it easy for you. It's almost, I would say, dummy proof, you know? What does Ford give you in their service? Here's one from a truck here. It's going to tell you exactly what it interprets Instead of reaching, uh, there's your DPF pressure right there, 0.08. But there you can see that the DPF load is what? It's clean. So if you're using a Ford uh, scan tool or something related to Ford that uses Ford software, you're going to see that it's going to tell you overall the conditions of the DPF. So that's easy to diagnose. It's going to tell you, yeah, we're pretty clean. Got no issues there. You know, so pretty easy. All right. Any questions? Hopefully you have questions there as I'm moving along we'll, at the end here. Okay, so when we're dealing, going back to what probably a lot of you are struggling with is the D-rate issues. So like I said, GM, Ford, Ram um, all have different strategies and directives. But one thing you have to understand that I mentioned also is that you need to have some kind of subscription, some kind of service, or the actual uh, components to actually reflash these engines. I like to use the OE. But I use a, a service here because since I'm not doing a lot of RAMs, for example, I pay a service that comes. It's a remote guy. He has all the different laptops for all the different models. I mean, excuse me. And he actually flashes them for me. So in this case, but you do have to have the ability to bring up-to-date flash. So a lot of the repairs related to SER, DPF after treatment, require you to have the latest in updating programming. I cannot stress that enough. So in this case, uh, be aware of that. Make sure you put those vehicles up to date with programming. But don't get in the trap. Make sure the customer has not installed any kind of tuner or after treatment, uh, after treatment, excuse me, aftermarket tuner in there that still allows the DLC DPF and SER, but it's just a tuner. So make sure it's all stock before you program it. And next is TSBs. Like I said, we're going to have a future webinar on TSBs. We'll start looking at technical service bulletins and the inexperienced that because experience has taught us that, you know, it has often told us that we need to keep the software up to date. There's components issues, there's connector issues. In other words, something that could lead you to the problem to help you fix it. So in this case, you know, you're like, well, I've done this. I've done everything, you know, that I learned or taught, blah, blah, blah. What do I do now? Well, maybe there's a TSB. 
That's why in preliminary diagnostics, one thing you want to look for is what TSBs are available for that vehicle. So I can't say enough about those technical service bulletins there. Okay. So remember, in your diagnostic approach, remember, you got to, are there codes set? Yes, I get it. But, you know, you all heard me talk over and over again about the diagnostic process, right? And in this case, uh, if a DTC for fuel or injector intake, various issues, you got to repair that first, right? And always keep in mind, any drivability issue you had that you repaired, again, fueling, intake, whatever it might be, sensor, how did it affect that after treatment system? Did it cause more suit accumulation? Did it cause more ammonia slip? What? And regeneration is most of the time required to perform since the vehicle should leave the drive-in service facility with a clean DPF and a NOx catalyst not loaded with excess ammonia. So you can run exhaust fluid quality tests like on a GM. You can run catalyst efficiency tests on a RAM, but you can also do as well run drive cycles for a Ford to validate that. And guys, we put it all into repair. You know, we all put it in repair. So quit being scared about, well, now the customer is going to have to pay more money. No, no. So therefore, that's all included in our diagnostics or our repair as well. We don't mess around with that because we need to ensure that doesn't take place, that we have a issue. Let's say I just did a map sensor on the truck. And two days later, the truck's back with a NOx concentration code set, right? This is something you could have avoided. You're trying to make sure that that's done correctly. I don't know about you guys, but when even when we used to do a major engine repair, let's say we did head gaskets, we would tell the customer that if they can come back in a week for 10, 15 minutes, let's just take a quick look. And you'd be surprised what we found. Sometimes we missed a clamp. We missed something. We, we scan it. We see an issue. We're trying to keep the customer happy to avoid those comebacks and those check engine lights coming back on. Make sense? So the question when evaluating the poisoning of a catalyst is to always remember, you know, you got to ask the customer, what are they using for fuel additives? Are they approved? Are they cat friendly? If not, we're going to have poisoning of these catalysts. And we see it more and more. As I look at all these different crappy additives being sold, I won't name names, but again, you got to be careful about what the customer has been using. So, you all know about the good additives out there, and you all know about the bad additives out there. And lastly, just a sidebar, I can't tell you how many instructors, and now I'm going after instructors today. I've seen instructors literally run a truck in a closed classroom environment, and they have, they, I'm like, I could smell that exhaust, you know? It's like, Jesus, it's like, and the truck's running fine, by the way, but it just got an exhaust smell. And they're saying that the exhaust coming out of an after treatment is cleaner than what the air you breathe. That is such, I mean, when you see one instructor doing it, that's okay. One, two, now I've seen over three. I'm like, oh my God, no. What are SOX emissions? I call them SOX, you know? When fuel is burning an engine, the sulfur will be converted into sulfur dioxide. So this readily dissolves in water, produce an acid, which accounts for the irritation of your respiratory tract if you inhale it. It also affects the ecology. Oil and gas in the, in the ground, for example, can contain large qualities of sulfur, which can have to be removed in the refinery. So some countries even have lax regulation on sulfur content in fuel. So another reason for the ultra low sulfur fuel. I know about the lubrication. You need to tell me about that. But in this case, that's something we got to keep in mind. So knowledge is power. And there are other things. There's phosphorus compounds and so on. And that's in the diesel. So when we talk about emission control in the diesel, and we're just talking about NOx, and we're just talking about um, particulate matter, that's only part of the big picture of what emissions do truly come out, out of the diesel. So, all right. Well, I'm just about done. Hopefully you've learned something. Hello, Mr. David. Thank you, Tony. Uh, that was, wow, a very, very good presentation. A lot of very useful information um, and what I liked about it personally is you place in there some good, good real world examples, you know, that that's um, very, very useful for everyone, everyone. So not only do you learn the theory, but you have some real world examples, which are extremely useful. One thing, I, one question I had, you say uh, when you bring the vehicle in for uh, whatever it may be in the shop, it's good to update the, um, the, the, the system, the software. Do you charge for that? Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. That's part of the that's part of the diagnostics. We will charge for that extra. Yes. 
Okay, so even in the repair, diagnostics and updates are, are charged for. Okay, it's good to know. Correct. Very yeah, good. Uh, experience has shown us that. I've always believed in the past, and I I used to I can't I mean, it might sound like a contradiction, but I used to say that you know if it if it ain't broke don't fix it. However, yeah. though, with issues we've had with after treatment, many repairs we have done had been fixed by updating the flash files and if you read the fine print on many technical service bulletins and even service procedures for regeneration ser and so on are telling you to make sure that the vehicle has the latest flash file in it sure sure very very good points other than uh, some good comments here thank you very much for an excellent class i don't see any other questions at the very present time but i would like to first of all thank you tony for the uh, excellent presentation Thanks to everyone who participated today. We really appreciate your uh, participation and uh, look out for an email with all of the information for uh, August's uh, presentation. And just a plug for Lucas, uh, if you keep us in mind for your fuel injection needs, um, we have a lot of uh, product uh, that you may be able to use. So keep us in mind for uh, the future. Uh, last but not least, uh, there is a recording of all of this presentation and previous presentations. They're all on our YouTube channel. So just look for Lucas Diesel Systems on the YouTube channel. And I, I believe Tony also places his um, the presentation on uh, his uh, uh, web page. Is that correct, Tony? Yes, sir. OK, very good. So other than that, um, thanks very much to everyone. And we look forward to seeing you again in August. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.